Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I would like to talk about few of the regs that really shaped our field and that started the interest in uh, things nautical. Of course, people have always been interested in things that are on the bottom. People have always been interested in older ships. Uh, Nicolas Witzen himself spent significant portion of his book proposing reconstructions of Roman galleys. And inevitably, inevitably, all Renaissance and early modern authors uh, until the uh, 17th century included began all such treatises with a proposed reconstruction of Noah's Ark. Where would we be without the reconstruction of Noah's Ark? Yeah, ask me about this some other time. I was once offered uh, funding to go look for Noah's Ark. Strangely enough, I refused. But returning to this, there are a few very interesting early vessels that are not very well known among the general public and uh, I dare say even among the ship modeling uh, public. Of course, everybody knows Mary Rose, Vassa. These are well known. They have been in the public uh, consciousness for quite a while now. But currently, I would like to address a few of the early discoveries because ship archaeology as such began really in the 19th century. Perhaps a couple of terms. What is the difference between maritime archaeology and underwater archaeology or nautical archaeology? Quite often people believe that these are synonymous. They're not quite. They're all related, but they're not quite the same thing. Maritime archaeology is really the umbrella term. It covers every in a study of the material culture that has anything to do with seafaring in any form or fashion. Parts of maritime archaeology are underwater archaeology, which is exactly what it says on the tin. Anything, the, any material culture, any physical evidence for human activity that is currently underwater. It may not have originally been underwater. To it, the inundated early Bronze Age settlements. I was a member of a team that excavated one in the Black Sea. Uh, but anything, so it may be settlements, it may be shipwrecks, it may be abandoned ships, anything that has to do with seafaring that is underwater now is obviously underwater archaeology. And then there is nautical archaeology. Personally, I consider myself a nautical archaeologist because nautical archaeology deals specifically with ships. They may be on dry land, Vasa, the ship burials, the Viking ship burials, ship sacrifices, and that's what we will be talking about in just a moment here. Anything to do with watercraft, whether they are on dry land, underwater, or in any other form or fashion that you can think of. That falls within the sphere of nautical archaeology. And both underwater and nautical archaeology are part of maritime archaeology. So, without further ado, let us begin talking about specific wrecks that really started our, physical st uh, our studies of physical remains of shipwrecks. Here, I will take my laptop and I will show you a few of uh, the slides that I have in mind. The first vessel that we will be discussing is the Nidam ship. It was excavated between 1859 and 1863 by the archaeologist Konrad Engelhardt. And it was excavated essentially in a bog at the settlement of Nidam, which at the time was part of Germany, though at the moment it is part of Denmark. The site itself is broader than simply the shipwreck. It is a warrior sacrifice site. Uh, parts of shields, part of, uh, parts of helmets were excavated, swords that were intentionally bent in two, which is evidence that this was a sacrificial site rather than a burial site, sensu stricto. So the site was in use, the bog was in use for quite a long period of time, from the middle of the 3rd century AD to about the middle of the 6th century, so nearly 300 years of depositions. There are more than one ships, at least three ships, there, uh, at least two ships were buried there. 
but the one was best preserved, almost complete, and was fully excavated, documented, and is exhibited in a museum nowadays. That is the Nidam vessel. As you see it here, the Nidam ship is very interesting with two things. In a way, it is an early version or a precursor of the Viking vessels. It has clinker hull, it is uh, fastened with iron roves, cleats are carved out of the plank inside that tie the planking to a frame uh, net, I suppose, is one way of putting it. The vessel was strictly rowing ship, and even many of the oarlocks survive on, in the boat. It had one quarter rudder, which was on the starboard side of the vessel, as it it's typical for the north, specifically for the Baltic region. She would have been quite flexible. There is absolutely no evidence for a sailing rig. And in reality, this is one of the big questions of Nordic uh, seafaring. At what stage mast and sails emerge? Because the early vessels that we have from the 4th century BC um, until the seventh or so century, we definitely do not have evidence for sailing rigs. We have only evidence for rowing. The ship itself is quite large. It is dated specifically to the fourth uh, century AD based on dendrochronological uh, analysis. It has been published. There are a number of publications that show it. And it is a beautiful, interesting vessel. A little bit later in the 19th century, Olof Rich excavated the Tune ship in uh, 1867 in Norway. This vessel is nowhere close to the state of preservation of the Nidam or some of the later Viking vessels, but we do see positive evidence of a sailing rig on this vessel. It is much later that we are already seeing uh, the remnants of a vessel that is related to the Jokstad, to the Osberg vessels. We have the typical mast step that uh, you see in the central part of the hull here, this is something that we will continue seeing throughout the Viking ship era. Not much more can be said about this vessel. And then, of course, this is in chronological order of discoveries rather than actual excavation, the very well-known Jokstad ship. I have already spoken about it in some detail, so I will not... Uh, take time to discuss it in detail again. But again, you see immediately in front of the burial chamber, we see the typical Viking Age mast step. On top of that, to some extent, also substitutes for a keelson. The timbers of the vessel were dated to around 890 AD, felling date. Uh, usually, in secondary literature, the vessel is listed as 10th century, but we see that it was actually constructed in the tail end of the 9th century, though it almost certainly was buried in the beginning of the 10th century. This was found in the uh, late 19th century. The next interesting of these early formative uh, projects was the Osbear ship, which was excavated in 1903. And again, it is, we, we have spoken about it, I will not repeat it, but it was a ship burial. It was not an ocean going vessel, it was essentially a pleasure vessel, a uh, um, prestige ship that was used to control and to remind the local fjords who is in charge. It was buried. This vessel is older than the Jokstad by a good 60 years since we know that she was buried around 834 AD, therefore the ship was uh, even older than this. I'm very much looking forward to receiving the publication of uh, Bibike Bischoff on the Osberg ship, because that is likely to be a very interesting read, since she has redone completely the uh, traditional interpretation of the vessel. We have spoken about the north and in some ways archaeology and this sort of uh, archaeology really began there. But the Mediterranean was not too far behind. Simply the survival there is much more questionable than in the north. 
And since it is still winter when I'm recording this video, might as well head to the Mediterranean now by looking at the famous barges of the Emperor Caligula, which were buried. It has always been known since at least the Renaissance and probably through most of the Middle Ages uh, that there are two vessels in Lake Nemi. Periodically, when the waters of the lake dropped sufficiently, remnants of the vessels were visible. Periodically, fishermen, divers, etc., swimmers recovered bits and pieces of sculpture and decoration and uh, even marble and bronze castings from these vessels. But it was not until really the 1930s that it was possible to undertake proper study of these vessels. When the fascist leader Duce Mussolini, in a typical megalomaniacal project, decided to drain the lake in order to recover Caligula's barges. They are known variably either as Caligula's galleys or barges. In reality, if we are to use a modern term for them, they were houseboats, they were pleasure floating palaces. Nothing more, nothing less than this. They certainly were not uh, ocean going. They were, of course, being in fresh water in excellent state of preservation. The lake was drained, the barges were recovered, the museum was uh, built around it. Unfortunately, the museum and the original hull remains mostly were destroyed during World War II, during the battles between the retreating Germans and the advancing Americans. Needless to say, both sides are exchanging blame for who destroyed the museum. I will not take a stand on this uh, at the moment, it's too controversial. Suffice it to say that when I was a graduate student uh, many years ago, a lady whose father had been a GI who fought in Italy and who had just passed away brought us a box of material from, uh, that he had brought from Italy. She knew nothing about it. There were old bronze castings and copper castings, but she was wondering whether they have any value. All of them had numbers modern numbers written on them. So we went to the library. I was graduate assistant, uh, research assistant to Professor Chrisman at the time. Went to the, uh, our own research library, checked the catalog of the Nemi barges, and sure enough, every single catalog number, uh, every single number of these elements that we were seeing in the box checked against the catalog number in the publication. All of them were stolen from uh, the burning museum in Nemi, as we suspected. Unfortunately, there was nothing we could do about it. Couldn't return, it couldn't do anything. So there it went. I have no idea what has happened with this material. She was planning, I believe, to sell it off. And the final uh, vessel that I would like to discuss now mm -hmm. is the famous Sutton Hu. It is a burial ground, and again, we believe that there are more than one ship uh, buried there. But the largest, the most possibly richest of the graves there has attracted a lot of attention from land archaeologists, historians of early Anglo-Saxon uh, Britain, and of course from ship archaeologists. There was even a popular film recently made and published, The Dig. It is about this discovery. Uh, don't, well, do take the film with a certain grain of salt, of course. The conflict uh, depicted there did not exist in reality. The two archaeologists, the uh, vocational and the professional, actually worked remarkably well together when they were excavating. The vessel itself did not survive at all. All that we found in the ground, or they found in 1939, was the impression of a ship. They found the rivets along the seams, and they documented them fantastically well. Well enough that all this data could be entered in computer programs nowadays, and a new reconstruction of the vessel could be proposed, which is what Dr. Pat Tanner is working on, or was working on earlier, and he even published an article on the subject. It is another fantastically interesting, important vessel from the very beginning of the 7th century. And, uh, it is an extremely valuable site. Plans are 
underway to build a full-scale replica. Of course, the question remains whether she was a sailing ship or purely rowing vessel of the East End. But unfortunately, we cannot answer this question because the central part where the mastep would have been is also where the burial itself was. And uh, while the, it was believed for a while that this may be a cannotaph burial, that you say without a, bo uh, without a body in it, more recent studies have found the remnants of phosphate, which suggests that there actually was a dead body buried in this area. Whatever the case may be, the burial chamber has essentially destroyed any physical evidence for what was in this section of the hull. And with this, we bring to a close the early attempts in uh, studying of maritime archaeological material, and specifically ships. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for liking and uh, commenting and asking questions, which I should be delighted to attempt to answer. Until next time. Thank you.